by the lovely bit of road that uh, certainly gets some adrenaline flowing. Anyway, what we're going to do now, we're going to head back to my pub shed and have a chat about my last 50 years of driving and all the fun I've had and all the trouble it's got me into. I dare say we'll have a few beers as well. So I'll see you back at the pub. Hi there, come on in. I'm, I'm just getting a pint and then we'll, we'll get sat down and I'll tell you all about today's video. Looking nice. Now, most of my past videos have been about wild camping. Uh, that's what the channel is mainly about. Um, whether it's uh, high up on the hills or high up in the trees. Um, yeah, main, wild camping has been my main interest for many years. And that is what my videos have all been about. I did go through, I think a couple of years I went exploring underground drains and culverts uh, got some fantastic photographs uh, but then I sort of run out of uh, places to go so I stuck with the wild camping but before all this before all this and YouTube my main interest was cars and driving so I thought it would be nice to sit in the pub shed and we can uh, chat about my driving history, um, my love of cars and interest of cars and uh, also some of the uh, many crashes that I've ever had. I've got quite a few old photographs of uh, cars I've had in the past. Now I know my style of driving won't suit everybody and I've upset a lot of people and I have got into a lot of trouble in the past. But that is the real me. That's what I'm like and it, it's important, you know, what the the real uh, me is like. Um, I love driving. Uh, I like to bomb round in my car. It sort of gets a bit of adrenaline uh, flowing and I like the challenge of it. Um, it's possibly that that makes me want to wild camp in the places that I do. Um, it, it comes from all, probably all stems from that. The, the challenge of uh, doing something a bit different and, and to your limit and get some real adrenaline pumping around your body. I think uh, in the past we all used to drive a little bit wild um, when we were younger. But uh, the thing is, I never really grew out of it, and I still drive like that today. Um, I just love taking my my car out on uh, some of our local roads uh, that I know so well. Um, it's only a small car, so I don't go too fast. Get the radio turned up full blast, get my foot down, and just thrap it round some of them bends, and... Uh, you do, you feel young again and that is very important to me because I have no intention of ever getting old. A quick slurp I think. Now my first uh, form of four wheel transport was what we call a trolley. When we were very young, we used to build these out of a basically a six foot scaffolding plank, a board on top, two sets of pram wheels, nice bit of carpet on, you'd lay on your belly, steer it with your hands, your face was about six inch 
from the road and you bomb down these hills and did you get a sensation of speed wow luckily we didn't hurt ourselves too much well that was the the first four wheel transport i had then we progressed the cycles but sheffielding a good place to go cycling it's all hills Eventually, you learn to drive 17 in England, uh, in the UK, so I passed my test when I was about 18, uh, th third attempt, uh, I, I struggled to get through, I kept doing a few things wrong, um, I think I got bored with the training, um, but yeah, I eventually passed third time, and then I bought my dad's Austin 1100 off him. It was a 1971 J Reg, yeah, Austin 1100 Mark II in white. Um, didn't last long though. Three weeks after I bought it off him, I wrote it off on uh, Rivlin, oh, Manchester Road in Rivlin Valley. Um, I was bombing up there, went round a bend, completely lost it on this bend. All I can remember. I ploughed into a wall, there was a loud banging noise, I'd basically broken all the doors on the driver's side of the passenger side, I broke all the doors open, the front end of the car dug into the wall, it flipped it right round, it threw me out the car, we never wore seat belts in those days, I can remember flying through the air like that and the car also in the air was following me and we flew through the air for a bit I landed on one side of the road and the car landed on the other um, I'll just show you a photograph of it not a scratch on me didn't hurt myself at all but as you can see the car looked a right mess you can see I nearly broke both wheels off all that side was piled in, the driver's door glass had gone um, and the doors just flew open um, it basically wrote the car off that's uh, the car in the I think probably the scrap yard where it was going to be taken away uh, my dad weren't pleased neither that lad you can see in the uh, top right hand side of the picture that were my best mate Billy Knowles um, we went down to have a look at the car sad to say Billy passed away about 20 years ago and uh, I still think of him and miss him to this day anyway that was uh, my first car so that that was me not driving for, you, for a few months while I waited for the insurance money to come through. Once I did get the insurance money, I managed to acquire another car. A quick photograph here. It's a 1972 Mini 1000 in aqua blue. Now, we went all over in this car. Um, first time venturing abroad went all over south of france um went as far as italy right down to naples if you look at this photograph here you can see that's my mini coming down this alpine road and you'll look there's no radiator grill on the front it was so hot that the the car was overheating and the only way we could keep going was to take the radiator grill off put the heater on full blast in the car and that uh, that cooled well it cooled the car down not necessarily us but yeah we did go all over in uh, my little mini but it did go the same way as my previous car I did have a few smashes in it um, only minor ones and then one morning, going to work, uh, it was a snowy morning, I was just uh, driving down the hill, and I saw a car skid in front of me, 
there were this ginormous bang and I looked and where I was sat I could see my front wheel um, my windscreen had gone my door uh, window had gone it had stripped all the wing uh, off uh, and I could see the, the front wheel um, looked in my mirror I could see the other car behind me it was his fault uh, I'm pleased to say but it, it had ripped my car off so uh, I'd, uh, I'd lost my second car now as you can see from the photograph uh, we did used to get proper snow in them days that was about two to three foot deep uh, that were classed as normal uh, that was a proper winter back then now I had been using my Mini for work uh, I worked as an electrical power engineer for the old Yorkshire Electricity Board and uh, I had my car on a running agreement and basically YB as it was known paid me an absolute fortune to run my car for work but I was getting to an age where time to leave home so I thought I would use the insurance money when I got it through I used the insurance money for a deposit on my first house and uh, at work they introduced a contract hire scheme about the same time so I took a contract hire car so I'll finish this off get another pint and then I'll tell you about the best car I've ever owned Just look at that. Cheers then. So we're around 1978-79 now. They just introduced this contract hire scheme at uh, work and naturally I'm only about 23, 24, so I thought I'm going to have the best I can get. I looked at the list, there it was, uh, Ford Capri 2 litre S. I thought I'm going to have one of them, best you could get. £30 a month I think, something like that, but uh, never mind the expense, I were having that car. At that time... All my mates were probably driving around in Anglers and Mark 1 Cortinas, uh, stuff like that. And I could have this Capri. Just show you a picture of it. So you can see that's my uh, 2 litre S Capri in a Stratos Silver, I think they called it. Uh, you can see it's parked outside what is Giverton Park Primary Substation. My job at the time was possibly, oh, I think I've, I've moved on, but it was, may, I did spend a lot of time maintaining all the switch gear in that type of substation. Uh, I had moved on to overhead lines when I took this. But uh, yeah, so that, that's uh, what I could call a normal picture of it just sat there. But uh, yep, that was the best car I ever had, I think I can say. Thinking back, it was probably a bit irresponsible of the way be to let somebody like me have a car like that. Um, but who cares? I was uh, invincible anyway. Around that time, we started uh, going on some really long European road trips. Uh, a friend of mine I work with, uh, he'd got a similar car to me. We used to take both Capris all over all over Europe uh, 
I'll I'll try and show you a few pictures of some of the places we went and uh, obviously photographs of the car as well. So this somewhere in France you can see both uh, Capri's parked up. We went all over France. We used a few campsites but very rarely. Occasionally we'd use one because they got facilities like showers and toilets but uh, we weren't really suited to, to campsites. We were, well as you can see, we, we were much happier roughing it in car parks and laybys. This is probably a favourite uh, car park. We had Cannes, south of France, called at this one many a time. High up in the Alps somewhere, just look at them beautiful mountains. And this, well that would probably be, yeah that's Monaco in the 1980s before it were really developed. Uh, used to call there each year and this was a, a great car park uh, we used to sleep in. Now probably on those photographs you saw my uh, Silver Capri had a couple of big spotlights on the front. They were uh, Sibi Super Oscars, about the most powerfulest driving light you could get on. So I mounted them on the front and uh, we used to drive down the auto route heading down to the south of France and we did at the time, we'd we do 100, 110 mile an hour, just get your foot flat down. We wanted to get down as quick as we had. So we, we bombed down about 110 mile an hour and he used to come up behind these French and very other, peop other people. Put them Super Oscars on, they soon moved out of the way. Literally, the, you can imagine the heat from them lamps nearly melted the back of their cars like... Uh, but yeah, so we, we got a clear run down and we used to fly down. We could do Sheffield to uh, probably around Saint-Tropez. I think we did it in about 17, 18 hours and that was the ferry crossing. But it were, it were, it were driving flat out and wow, it were exciting. It was a really exciting. Now luckily my job at the time I was working on overhead lines so you basically got the opportunity to drive down a country lane every day when you when you visited the lads who were working on the lines and that uh, whether rebuilds or or whatever so it was like it was like going on a, a rally each morning you went to site uh, Capri it was a bit long and it was a bit tail happy. I'll just show you a couple more pictures. Now that is one of my favourite bends uh, up at Burbridge Bridge not far from Ringing Low. 90 degree bend. You hit that hard and I could get the back end out and you can just power around that bend. That was a beautiful bend and I, I still drive around it today. Another picture here that's uh, just driving through some uh, some water and that. Uh, a lot of these photographs were taken on old cameras and I've had to crop the photographs to get the um, the wide screen view. So the, uh, the quality isn't that good but hopefully you can get an impression uh, of the fun from the, the photographs. couple of stories with me Capri uh, I can remember once I was we used to have to take <coughs> trainee engineers out with us uh, it's the way you learn in a way it's the way we learn the way they learn I once took this lad out with me and uh, it was Mexpra Rotherham and I, I, I knew this track we were going down and it's got three humps in it and if you hit it to fair speed you can literally take off so I went, I went down the first hump and I hit it a bit harder than I intended and I literally took off. But because I were airborne, I landed in the other hole um, and took off even higher 
and we were literally flying and I glanced over and he, he did look a bit worried I must admit and then the next one we landed in it was full of water it was a massive puddle and when I hit the water the water pressure was so great it blew the gear stick gator off and poof, all dirty water blasted into the car uh, he never did come out with me again uh, I must admit but uh, yeah I did uh, damage that car uh, quite a bit another time I was working in a farmyard and I, I drove onto this concrete ramp um, and drove down it and I didn't realise it it was where all the slurry was from the cow sheds so it, it was like liquid liquid cow shit basically and I drove the front of my car into it and it just disappeared, it, the front end disappeared into all this cow muck, uh, liquid cow muck. Anyway, I didn't think much of it, but um, a few probably months later, it had to go in for a bit of repair. I think they were putting a new bumper on it. And when I picked it up, uh, the uh, the reception bloke came over, he said, we've, we've just replaced that uh, bumper on your car. And the mechanic says, it was full of shit. It was actually all the front end of the car, every crevice had got liquid congealed cow muck in it. So um, I said, oh yeah, I, I, I remember it, uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, some, uh, some great stories in that car. So the car did get me into a lot of trouble. Uh, I did acquire quite a few endorsements uh, with it. If you're young, that an endorsement is like your point system now. You used to get one one endorsement for each speeding offence and things like that. Uh, so I, I did acquire a few endorsements. And I think alarm better bells were starting to ring back at work because in the the first 18 months of ownership I think I had 18 tyres on it which they weren't very happy about uh, I had to go and see the area engineer for an interview and I got a written warning written warning for misuse of uh, the board's transport but at that age you weren't really bothered one of them things I'd had a lot of fun in it so I actually bought the Capri back off the hire company because it were only three year hire and then I, I ran it for about another five years uh, on the running agreement system um, but I think I, I ended up with 120,000 on the clock and reliability had gone and I had to have a reliable car so I had to sell it and I thought I know I'll go back on the contract hire scheme um, I sold the car and I looked at the list, I'd already looked at the list and they got a 2.8 injection Capri on it. Wow, if I could have that, fantastic. So I'd set my heart on getting this 2.8 injection, sold my other one, uh, filled out all the paperwork and then I think uh, probably a message came down from senior management uh, no way is Pat Dickinson having a 2.8 injection Capri. So it was the end of an era. But what a fantastic eight years and that is the best car I have ever had. Nothing has ever come anywhere near it. Um, I suppose I was young, it was fun, fantastic times but nothing has ever matched it since. So I'm going to finish this off and then we're going to we're going to look at some of the other cars. They were all mediocre, but we'll have a look at them. So just get rid of this. I'll come back to you when I've got another pint and we'll uh, look at the other cars. Now I had um, several cars over the next 20 year period 
none of them was anything special. Uh, they were used for work, that was it, the main use, but you could use them for your own, own use as well. I think when they said I couldn't have the uh, 2.8 injection Capri, that the fastest thing that was on the list was uh, MG Montego. Two, I think it was 2 litre again. Uh, it was okay. Um, I'll show you a picture. So this is the MG Montego in red. Um, it's actually parked on the site of the old Blackburn Meadows power station. That's the cooling towers in the distance, obviously long gone. That's um, Tinsley Viaduct, go, uh, the M1. Um, as the M1 passes through Sheffield, it goes over the viaduct. Uh, but uh, again, most of my photographs of cars come when I was at work. And I might add, I never crashed this car. It went back in perfect condition. While we're looking at these cars, uh, another nice car I had was a Ford Orion um, 1.6 gear. It was, uh, this was a lovely car, uh, 1.6, so not super powerful. Again, the photograph you can see was taken at work. Uh, it's the only photographs I've got. I was replacing a substation you can see on the left. That had literally blown up, and I was replacing it with a new substation. You can see the state of my car covered in mud. And you can see why they tended to get wrecked with the places I had to take them. Another picture here. You can see I even became a caravanner for a short while. It didn't last long. This was a trip to Scotland. We got as far as Barnsley and then we managed to block the M1 briefly. Uh, I might add, I wasn't driving at the time. After that, we decided to stick to camping. A lot safer. Then later on, I had a Montego Estate. That were in British Racing Green. Uh, picture quality is rubbish, but... Uh, you can see, surprising how many electricity poles you can actually carry on a car roof rack. Now, for nearly all my working life, I had a company car, which weren't a bad thing. But I, d I like to mess with cars, to modify them, to customise them. And obviously, the, a lot of these were lease cars, and I couldn't touch them. So I did miss that. So I was on the lookout for another car. One night in a pub in 1996, somebody offered me a 1971 MGB GT for 300 quid. So I snapped up the offer and I bought this. As you can see, it looks a bit of a wreck. Toe de tome, had a quick look at the bodywork and realised oh, I were in a right state. Very rusty. And I didn't fancy doing a complete rebuild on it. So then I thought, what about a kit car? This would me mechanically sound and would make a good donor car. I looked through and I found a car called an, an NG, which stands for Nick Green. So it was an NG TC. It was a bit of a, like a 1930s Alfa Romeo replica. And I thought, yeah, that, that looks good. I'll go for one of them. So... In 1996, I started the build of my kit car. And by coincidence, my first son was born that year. So I realised this was going to be a bit of a slow build. So this is what is left after I stripped the car. Just had to cut it up and take the rusty body shell to the tip. Now the new kit came with a new chassis, you can probably just make it out in black and uh, I got the engine and box mounted, all the suspension 
and uh, wheels in place. This shows the body tub um, all ready to go on. As you can see, I had dark hair back then. Here, the body tub is on in place and also I've assembled the aluminium bonnet plus the mud guards and, and the lighting. Uh, any, any panels that needed fitting have been fitted. So, it's uh, basically ready for the paint shop. That is the only part of the build I didn't do. Everything else I did. So when it came back from the paint shop, uh, quite an enjoyable job fitting the uh, wiring loom. This photograph shows uh, the fully painted car. I've got my new split rims and tyres. Time to get the sewing machine out. I got all the inner upholstery panels to make, uh, the, the seating to fit and a tonneau cover to make, so plenty of sewing to do. And that's the car basically finished. As you can see, it's just got aero screens, uh, there's no doors on it, basically you just climb in. It was a great experience to drive, although you were exposed to the elements somewhat. I did buy a full face crash helmet later on, just for a bit more protection. This is another one of my favourite driving roads, up on Burbage, above Ringinlow. We might visit this road later on in the video. Now, the plan was to fit a V8 uh, engine and SD1 box to the car. I managed to source all the bits but a new baby arrived. That was my second son. So the V8 conversion never really materialised. I'm afraid I sold the car and I'm sad to say it became a trailer tent. We had good use out of the trailer tent, but even sadder to say, that was sold and it become a big TV. What a decline, but that's family life for you. So over the, the next few years, I had quite a few more uninteresting cars, big Rover 600, um, a Citroen, don't know if it was C3, not not sparkling at all. Uh, I had a Kangoo, it was like a van with windows in. Uh, that were really interesting car, that uh, I quite enjoyed that. Uh, it was great with two young children, they got the sliding doors at the back and uh, we could pile loads of stuff in it. Um, so I had that for quite a few years. Uh, I did break the rear axle by piling too much firewood into it and then I drove it into a post in a car park that I didn't see, uh, wrecked all the side of the car, uh, we'd been taking the company, YEDL or whatever we were called then had been taken over by privatised, taken over by the Americans and the Americans do not like your bending cars. So I got another written warning. So I had two written warnings in a 40 year career, both were for driving cars. So it would appear, no matter how good you were at your job, if you're a bit careless with cars, yeah, you got written warnings. So that was the Kango. I then replaced that with a Renault Clio. Um, that were a nice little car. I had that for probably about uh, six years, hundred and over hundred thousand on clock. Um, by then, had retired then, and I think my interest in cars had declined somewhat. Um, so that's probably now why I drive a Peugeot twelve hundred, um, little Peugeot twelve hundred. Mind you, little 1200, it's got 81 brake horsepower. My 2 litre Capri only had 98. So there ain't, there ain't too much difference. And 
it's quite nippy. It's probably a good thing it's not too powerful. I can drive that flat out over all these roads I've driven for years. I know every bend, every little bump. You can drive it flat out and there is still a thrill in driving like that. Because, because I'd always had a company car, my wife, she, she, the car she had was more like the family car. And we, we had a couple. The best one was this one. Now this was a 2 litre, well it was a Ford Mondeo Estate 2 litre gear. Oh, it was lovely inside. It was a beautiful car. We had it for probably 8 years. It suited, with having 2 children you could pile all the stuff in. Um, and obviously we used it for, for towing for for camping and that. Uh, this picture was taken at uh, Barnborough Castle North East. I think we'd just been towed off a muddy campsite. That's a uh, family camping for you. As for the future, I don't know. My love of cars and driving is still there and I, I keep wondering what to do. I've always fancied getting something like a 1950s, 60s vintage car and uh, basically having it as a hobby to work on, to, to renovate. Uh, then I think to myself, would, would I have the time? I struggle with spare time at the moment. Or perhaps buy a modern hot hatch like a, a Fiesta ST or even a Focus ST. I could really scare myself in one of them. Or do I stay as I am with my little boring uh, Peugeot 208 1200cc? Um, I just don't know. Uh, I'm not sure which way to go. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed uh, my little journey through 50 years of driving. Um, I've had a, a great time, I've seen some great places and generally I've really enjoyed all, anything to do with driving over the, the last 50 years. Alright, it's got me into an awful lot of trouble. It's cost me a lot of money, but I've had an enjoyable time. I've learned lots of new skills, and uh, generally, yeah, I've I've enjoyed every every minute of it. I've no intention of calming down. Um, I still enjoy a good thrap round my uh, country lanes uh, in my little Peugeot. I know every bump, every bend, and you can uh, you can drive that little car right to the limit, and it gets some right adrenaline flowing. So a boy racer to the end. Anyway, it's been uh, great talking to you, and great to share my driving experiences. Uh, I've really enjoyed uh, doing this video. And uh, I hope to see you on the next one soon. I think we'll, we'll, we'll just finish this and we might have another. It goes down so well. See you then.